Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks uh, on Saturday, the third day of December 2011. This is episode 827. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice activated sync. Sync gives you versatile access to music, podcasts, and more from just about any device. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus or at Ford.com slash technology. And by Stamps.com. Print and buy official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer with Stamps.com. You'll never go to the post office again. Try it free right now. Visit Stamps.com, click the radio microphone, and use the offer code TECHGUY. Well, a good day to you. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time for the show that talks all about tech. Computers and the internet and cell phones and camcorders and MP3 players and home theater and, and all that jazz. So if you've got a question about some gee-gaw that you just purchased, maybe for Black Friday or you're getting for a holiday gift, or maybe you just want to know what to get for the geek in your life, if you have got uh, need a little hand-holding on the information superhighway, Here's the place. This is it. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. 888-827-5536. If you're outside the U.S., Skype us. It's a toll-free number. It won't cost you a penny. 8888-ASK-LEO. An auspicious birthday today. A happy birthday to text messaging today. 19 years old. Same age as my daughter. <laughs> text messaging began on this day uh, in uh, what was 19 years ago, be 1992, December 3rd, 1992. It, was, uh, it happened in Britain. Actually, the, the UK really jumped on the SMS bandwagon early. I remember hearing five, six years ago, before we really had text, you know, before people were text messaging much here, how big it was in, the great, in great Britain. A man named Neil Papworth used a personal computer to do it, to send a text message to Richard Jarvis of Vodafone, he was using in 1992, right? Okay, now, <laughs> what was he using? An Orbitel 901. I don't even know. This is a little before the uh, the iPhone. The text of the message was "Merry Christmas." Technology's been around for a while. It was created, uh, yeah, but but in uh, jointly by uh, France and Germany in 1984. But it really didn't happen much until about 10 years later when it took off. It didn't happen here in the States for a long time. And, I, you know, it's hard to remember a time when people weren't down there looking at their phone no matter where they were, walking into trees, driving into other people and all that stuff. Um, now everybody's text mess messaging constantly. But it wasn't uh, very popular in the U.S. initially because... And I don't know if you remember this, but if you were on, say, Verizon, you couldn't text message somebody on AT&T. It wasn't cross-network. And it wasn't until it became cross-network that you could send a text message to any phone from any phone that it started to take off in the U.S. And even then, I think it, it wasn't very popular until smartphones. Because remember, <laughs> on a feature phone to send a text message, if you wanted to type the letter C, you'd have to type A, B, C three times on that one key. I mean, it was just crazy. And you'd see kids go doo -doo 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 very quickly, but it was just not usable until we got smartphones and a real keyboard, and then text messaging really took off. In 2010, text messaging, SMS, is that, that's what we, short mobile, what was it, short, um, short message system, that's what it was called, generated $114.6 billion in revenue last year. 100. Let me say that again. $114 billion in revenue last year. Experts say mobile networks will earn $726 billion over the next five years from smart, from short mobile, whatever it's, short <laughs> message system, it's whatever it is. 
And even though they're losing uh, some market share to, well, Apple has announced iMessage. I, what is it, iMessage? That you that will will use SMS if that's all that it can use, but if not, it will use Wi-Fi and, and do it over data, saving you money. Facebook's got that Messenger app. We just, uh, you know, we, we're going to uh, France next week to, to cover a conference called Le Web, and my team has set up a message group with something called Group Me. That means we can send location, text, and pictures to everybody in the group, even make calls to everybody in the group, and often not using the SMS system because the phone companies really take you for a ride with SMS. If, if you're not paying a flat fee, and some people aren't, they're still paying as much as 40 cents a message, you're paying $1,500 a megabyte for your data on SMS. It's carried on a separate network from the phone and from the data. It's a, it's a, it, I guess it rides on the phone system, on the GSM phone system. So it's, it's really overpriced. It's really overpriced. But that's, why, that's how you make $114 billion in a year. Overcharging. It's a, it's a long-standing tradition with the phone company. So happy 19th birthday to text messaging. And, uh, boy, I, t I think that when it first started, it was very big, uh, first in Finland, I was told. And the reason being, of course, that's where Ericsson is and Nokia. They cell phone technology early on, uh, very popular in uh, Scandinavia, but particularly in Finland. And I was told by a Finnish fellow, that's because we don't like people. <laughs> We don't, we don't want to see people face to face. We don't want to talk to them. We don't want to meet them. We just want to text them. Maybe that's why we like texting so much. It is, isn't it efficient? It's very, you know, when, I, when my wife starts using a technology, I know that it's really become mainstream because she's not a geek like me. She's just a normal person. She just started doing email a couple of years ago, loves it. And for the longest time did not understand text messaging. She has an iPhone. And now uses it all the time. So I know it's, it's, it's happened. It's mainstream. It's crossed over. Ericsson is in Sweden. My, my, my apologies. You see, we have a, a, a very sophisticated international audience who knows things like that. I apologize. Ericsson's in Sweden. Nokia's in Finland. What do you think? Are you a text message user? Text messaging user? Is, I mean, it's certainly become a problem with highway safety, with traffic safety. In fact, I see programs now that parents putting on their uh, cell phones for their kids that when the phone is moving, they can't text anything. And I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number if you want to talk about text messaging and how you use it. 19, year old, 19 years old today. Pretty, pretty interesting. We'll also talk about this carrier IQ thing. You probably heard it. It was a big news story. The idea that Sprint and AT&T, uh, and I imagine the other guys too, put software on their phones that track what you do with the phones. Now, Carrier IQ and the phone companies say that they just use this to monitor network use to improve their network. But Trevor Eckhart, who was a 25-year-old security analyst, he started paying attention to this when he noticed that the network he managed was getting a lot of, you know, it was a business network, it was getting a lot of outbound traffic from employee cell phones. He said, what is this? He analyzed it, figured out it was Carrier IQ, blew the whistle on them. And then this week said, and by the way, not only are they monitoring uh, network traffic, they also can see every key press, everything you type, even on your banking and other secure accounts. Well, that may not be true. In fact, it looks like it's not true. So I just want to calm people down. Even if it were true, I don't imagine AT&T and... and uh, Sprint are all that interested in everything you type on your phone. It may be a side effect of the software, but I can't imagine they're collecting that information, nor is Carrier IQ, unless they really were hackers, evil people, and I don't think they are. But it turns out that Trevor may have misinterpreted what he was seeing. I've seen another security expert weigh in and say, no, they're not collecting keystrokes. It's a debugging feature of the software that shows that a key was pressed, but does not collect that and send it back to the home office. But it may be the only thing. First of all, so my first response is calm down. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and my second response is if you think that the cell phone isn't telling the home office what you're doing at every moment, where you are, 
Where, <laughs> then you're naive. Just as your internet service, people worry about Facebook and Google following them around. Your internet service provider, because they're the place you get on the net at home, they know everywhere you go. They know everything you do. They know when you are sleeping. They know when you're awake. They know when you've been bad or good. And your cell phone, same thing. Your internet service provider is your mobile carrier. So while I don't think Carrier IQ is a horrible thing, I think it's probably a good wake-up call to remember you are not alone. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, I want to talk about stamps.com. This would be a good time to do that, wouldn't it? All right, I'm going to do it. Now let's see, I have to push this button right here. The stamps.com button. Look at that. Where do we put the uh, stamp? So I was, you know, I, I, uh, we'll show it next week, I guess. We shot video of the stamps.com kit you get. I am a big fan of stamps.com. They're sponsoring the podcast for the next few weeks, so I want to encourage you, especially for the holidays, to try it. Let me tell you a little bit about what it is. First of all, go to the website, stamps.com. supports Macs and PCs, by the way. And it allows you to print postage from your computer and your printer. You don't need a postage meter. You don't need anything special. You just need stamps.com. And here's the cool thing. With stamps.com, the post office loves it because it, it, frankly, reduces the traffic to the post office. You're going to love it, too, because who wants to go to the post office during the holiday season? It's crazy. The lines, you know? The thing about stamps.com that I don't know if people know is not only do you print the postage on your printer, but, for instance, if it's international mail, they'll have the forms and they'll automatically fill it out. They'll take the address and information from QuickBooks if you're doing client mailings. If it's a package, you know, the post office, you can't drop a 13-ounce uh, or a bigger package into the mail. They want you to bring it to the post office, not with Stamps.com. Because it's, uh, of, of, it's th of the Stamps.com system, you can mail any package of any size without leaving your desk. The postal carrier will pick it up. You can call them for a special pickup, or they could just come by during their daily round, and they will pick it up and take it at, of any size. There's also some major discounts that you cannot get at the post office at stamps.com. It's great if you're an eBay seller. Uh, if you're doing Christmas cards, it's how we're going to do our Christmas cards. If you take advantage of the special offer, you're going to get a USB scale for free that will let you weigh your letter or package. It, it, it connects to the stamps.com software, so it's all automatic. So here's the deal. Go to stamps.com. Now, the, you'll see this deal on the front page. Don't do that deal. Click the radio microphone. Heard about us on the radio or the podcast? And use the offer code TechSpaceGuy. All right? T-E-C-H-G-U-Y. That's the special offer code for this offer. You get uh, now. Let me tell you what you get. Oh, it's me! <laughs> you get this. See, it's a better deal than the one on the front page. You get this scale free. You get the supplies kit. You get a month free trial and fifty-five dollars in postage. So this is your Christmas card list and then some. You can even mail a few packages with this. I want you to take advantage of this. It makes it very easy to do. International and certified mail fills out the forms automatically. You get discounts, 21% off express mail, 15% off priority mail. The post office really likes it when you use stamps.com. It, it, it offloads them. And, you know, they're closing post offices. I just found out they're going to close the Petaluma post office next year. So now's the time to get going with stamps.com so you become your own post office. Go to stamps.com, click the microphone. You Don't do the one that's on the front page. It's not as good a deal. And use text space guy as the offer code, okay? Stamps.com. It is the best way. How old is this picture? It's an old picture. <laughs> I'll have to send him a new one. My hair is not fully gray yet. That's from the uh, screensavers days. I started using stamps.com more than 10 years. I think, well, when they first started, and I, I even have custom stamps. They're now, I shouldn't have done this, but I printed stamps with my picture on them. And now they're, now they're uh, out of date because they're not the full postage. Stamps.com. Definitely recommended. And for this, for the podcast, use the offer code Tech Guy, would you? Tech Space Guy. Two words. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. All the trouble you can get into with uh, with uh, SMS text messaging. In that song, in that one song, you know, I, I I hesitate to mention it because it's a very adult. 
Um, but there is a wonderful site that you probably all know. I, even the name, I don't think I can say. Darn you, autocorrect, except it's not darn. Darn you, autocorrect, which is a site where they collect uh, autocorrect. You know, it's mostly iPhone. The iPhone autocorrect, as, as you'd figure with any Apple product, is a little imperious. It knows what, it, it knows what you meant to say. And uh, sometimes the results are so funny. I was reading the best or the most popular, um, I guess we, we, we inside Technorati call it the DYAC. I was reading the best DYACs of uh, 2011 last night, and I, 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 I almost uh, asphyxiated. I, was, I could, was laughing. Tears were running down. I lost my voice. I, was, I could not, but it's very adult. So don't send the kids there. Uh, but if you're comfortable, because autocorrect, sometimes it, you would think that autocorrect would never put in uh, anything uh, profane or adult in the, but it, what it modifies itself based on what you type. So <laughs> I don't, I think some of the, um, some of them I could probably say here, but many of them I couldn't. So I just, I leave it to you. Viewer discretion advised. You could, I think if you Google DYAC, you'd find it very funny stuff. And sometimes it's, you know, it's benign. Let me see if I can find some. Uh, most of them <laughs> are, are unfortunately a little, a little adult. <clears throat> I'll, I'll find one I can read. There must be. Well, meanwhile, back to, or to the phones we go. First to the phones we go. Steve. Our first caller of the day in Canoga Park, California, listening on the great KFI. Hi, Steve. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hey, uh, we have a quick question. Uh, I have one question. My son has a follow-up question. All right, good. Uh, That's, it's a family thing. It is. It is a family thing. Thank you. Uh, we are big Mac people, and we have a uh, PowerPC Mac T5. Oh, it's time and to upgrade that sucker. Yeah, I know, because we noticed recently this week all the websites we're going to they need the new version of Flash, and when we go to try and download the new version of Flash, it says it's not supported on a power PC. <sighs> That's what are, frustrating. What are our options? That's uh, uh, frustrating. It's not just Flash, though. You know, uh, the PowerPC G5, uh, Apple abandoned that, uh, how many years ago now? Is it six, seven years ago for the Intel chips? And for a while, they maintained compatibility, but with the latest two versions of the operating system, Apple themselves have said to users, you can't use these on the old chips. Many apps are now coming out that require the new operating systems or require the new chips. I'm, Flash is just the tip of the iceberg there. So uh, you probably, you know, the latest Flash needs a, a Snow Leopard, which, uh, yeah. yeah. And so you're, un unfortunately, uh, I hate to say it because that computer is perfectly good. It might be a little slow compared to what's out nowadays, but you, you've obviously been able to use it. Oh, absolutely. Is but is it a paperweight now? Well, I hate to say that. It's only, what, five years old, six years old? Yeah, it's about five years old, yeah. yeah. I hate to say that, but it is. Uh, Apple, yeah. unlike, um, you know, Microsoft has kind of a different attitude towards this. They really try to preserve compatibility as long as they can. Apple has always been willing to throw you under the bus in order to move to the next thing. And uh, the next thing for Apple was Intel. And then most recently, Snow Leopard and Lion, its new OS X operating systems, which have become increasingly, you can't get Lion unless you have Snow Leopard. You can't get Snow Leopard on a power PC. And you can't, I mean, it just, it, you can't get the App Store unless you have Snow Leopard. It goes on and on. And I do yeah. think that there, there is some reason to upgrade. Now, one way to do this would be maybe get a Mac Mini. That's the least expensive Mac. And it would be so much faster than what you've got right now. Yeah, I was looking at them today online. On four, yeah, I know. There's, there's six or seven hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I hate to say, yeah, you can't, that's, I didn't realize that they had done that with Flash. Now, you could stick with the old Flash for a while. Um, you can, but any of the sites you go to now, they all say requires the new Flash player, and it's, it download the new Flash player, and when you go to that, it says, oh, it's not supported on a power PC. Wow. Wow, that's, that stinks. Yeah, it does. There are reasons. Okay, I mean, well. the old Flash player had security issues and so forth. But nevertheless, I'm surprised Adobe has done this. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's Me Adobe too. and Apple together kind of pushing you into the uh, future. Uh, yeah. I just, I don't know what to say. I think that uh, this does happen in technology. It shouldn't happen in five years. A five-year-old computer 
isn't that old. I'll tell you, here's the here's if this makes you feel any better, Steve. The iMac, and I would get an iMac, really. That's the most compa you know, comparable upgrade for you. The iMac you buy today is, I don't think, going to have those problems for another 10 years. The, what's happened is that the computer, you never know with Apple, but what has happened is that there is kind of in the last couple of years, there's been a massive shift in computing and the power of modern hardware uh, and uh, has really kind of plateaued. It's, it's as, it, it was for a long time, as time went by, the faster and faster machines, and you needed them and you wanted them. It's really caught up now, and, and we aren't going to see much, much faster machines. We, and we're not going to, you know, and, and unless Apple, for purely reasons of greed, decides to do something that makes you buy a new computer, there really won't be as many reasons to do that going forward, I think. I think the computer you buy today should be good for 10 years. I really do. Uh, I don't anticipate Apple moving off the Intel platform. Um, I just think this is going to this, and I, I just think this is such. If you buy an i5 based iMac today, you're good for ten years. I don't call me in five years if I'm wrong, huh? Because <laughs> you never know. I just I, I. This is true on Windows too. And if you look at the operating system modifications over the last few versions of both Microsoft's and Apple's operating systems, Windows and OS 10, they've been teeny weeny little improvements bit by bit. There's not a whole lot more you can do with applications, with operating systems. I don't think we're going to see, you know, any big leaps. The only, the only thing I see on the horizon at all that could change things is voice control. Apple's put this Siri on their iPhone 4S, and I believe Apple's intent, and if Apple does it, you know Microsoft will copy it, is to make their operating system voice controlled. They really want to turn the desktop into something kind of like an iPad with voice control, full screen apps, and all of that stuff. Nevertheless, any hardware you buy today should be just fine for anything that can happen because it's working on the phone, right? Remember, all the, now the innovation that's going to happen in, in software is going to happen first in mobile. Those mobile processors have not caught up to desktop processors. So I think if it's any consolation, yes, you're going to spend a 1000 or more on a brand new iMac, but it will last you a lot longer than that old G5 on iMac. Unfortunately, you know, that, that's kind of, you, that, there's a cliff that happened right around 2006 when they went from PowerPC to Intel. <sighs> I hate I hate making people buy new computers, but I think that's really what's indicated here. 8888-ASK. I'm going to talk a little bit about voice control. Good New York Times article in just a sec. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK. Leo is the uh, number. Our website is techguylabs.com. You can go there if you uh, heard something and you want a link or whatever. It's got a search engine. It's uh, all 826 episodes are there. This is episode 827 and audio for many of them. You'll also find a link at techguylabs.com to our chat room, and to uh, which is going on right now. And there are lots of great people in there, as always. I love the chat room. And uh, also to uh, video because not only do we do audio of the show, we do video of the show. You can download it later as a podcast. We also uh, offer uh, uh, many other shows that are not heard on terrestrial broadcast, but the internet only. Uh, we do about 25 shows a week at uh, my podcast network, twit.tv. All geek, all geek stuff, all high geek, high end geek stuff. 8888 Ask Leo, that's the phone number. Uh, Ofer. In Laguna Niguel, you're next. Hi, Ofer. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, Leo. Good to speak with you again. Thank you, Ofer. Nice to talk um, to you. I just, I just discovered that uh, SMS messages, when you send a text message to a group of people, everyone in the group sees the numbers and uh, the phone numbers for all other recipients. Oh, that's not good, is it? That's a, that's a faux pas that people stopped, or many people, although I see it all the time, stopped committing in email. Where they put a CC to a thousand people, and now I've collected, I've harvested all your email addresses instead of putting it in the BCC. So there's no BCC blind carbon copy for text messaging, huh? Find one. I uh, checked online, and uh, you know, in the in the typical Android uh, or iPhone application, for that matter, there appears to be no BCC option. 
And uh, I was wondering if you know of something or if we should all switch to some other application. Well, you know, a lot of people don't use the carrier-supplied SMS anymore. They use, in fact, probably the biggest one is Facebook Messenger. But the problem with that, of course, uh, is that's not anonymous either because in order to message somebody or a group on Facebook, you know, well, let me think. Actually, I guess it would be. They'd be your friends. You could message anybody who had friended you on Facebook, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to see the contact information for the people they're getting back to. I use, a, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we use for our business a service called Group Me that's on all platforms. Windows, Mo This is why we use it. Windows Mobile, Android, and iPhone. I really like Group Me. It's free. And uh, it has a number of good features. Of course, if somebody's in a group, they'll see everybody else in that group. But that doesn't mean they'll get their phone. I don't know if they'll get their phone number or not. That's an interesting question. I, you know, chat room. Do you have? Uh, you know, chat room's telling you over that uh, just stop sending group SMS messages. But it's very convenient. There are a number of companies that specialize in group text messaging, and I would imagine that they would have some ways of hiding it. Let me see uh, if I can find Lifehacker has an article. Five best apps to send group text messages on the cheap. I'll put a, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And that might give us some information about uh, a system that we could use to do that kind of messaging without giving away information. It would be, it's impolite to do that, you know. You don't want to, they mentioned GroupMe. Beluga, they mentioned Beluga, but that's gone. That was bought by Facebook and, in fact, incorporated into Facebook Messenger. WhatsApp is another good one. Google Voice might have a way, I should check, of sending multiple messages without telling the other people on the message the phone numbers of everybody else on the message. That's what you want to do. So I'm, I'm going to take, I would take a look. That's a free service. If you go to voice.google.com, uh, you can use it to send text messages, both from a phone with the Google Voice app and from a desktop. I actually do that all the time. Because I sometimes, it's a pain to type text messages on phones, right? Well, if you have Google Voice, you can do it uh, from your desktop. It drives people crazy. I send very long, elaborate, perfectly spelled and punctuated messages from my computer, and they think I'm nuts. My kids mock me for that, by the way. They say, why are you, why are you capitalize sentences? Why are you using punctuation? What is wrong with you? That's a sign of somebody being old school. Not using the letter U for Y O U. That's a, that's a you're just old school. So oh, forgive those. Give those a, a try. That's a, you raise an interesting point. I hadn't really thought about. Peter, Brooklyn, New York. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Peter. Hi, Leo. Welcome I'm, to the show. I'm having a problem with. Uh, I, I have a mobile me personal email account, and I've tried to set it up on my Droid, Bionic, and also my Samsung Galaxy tablet. And for some reason, ever since they made the change to iCloud. I can't seem to get the, the server correct in order to have the email set up on my uh, device. That's interesting. And so that's your primary email, huh? Yes. I have a city. I work for the city of New York, and I have a work email with them, and that so that's perfect. Right. That works fine. I'm sure if it's an Exchange server or a standard POP server, no problem. I'm, it doesn't surprise me much that Android doesn't work well or doesn't play well with Apple's internal email system. Have you, have it you, used to work perfect. Yeah. It used to work perfect. Once they went to iCloud, that was it. It stopped Android devices. And my iPhone and my iPad, they work perfect because it's Apple. But the Android device, I, I can't seem to get on. It's been about maybe two months. I'm trying to, but I can't have, I don't have any luck. You know, I don't, in theory, it shouldn't be any different. They're still using that same server. In fact, that's why it's still, you know, Peter from Brooklyn at me.com or whatever your email. Don't send email to Peter from Brooklyn. I don't know who that is. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, sh it, it should still work. So I don't think they changed the server information in any way. Let me try it on my uh, Android phone. I'll try it in the next break and see. The chat room is saying, no, it seems to work fine. But maybe they have changed something in iCloud that uh, we don't we don't know about. Peter, I'll tell you what. Hang on, listen to the uh, radio, and I'll try to figure it out. How about that? There must be a solution 
out there somewhere. Uh, let me see. Do I have time for... I think I can get one more call in here before we have to take a break. And that'll be Jeff also in Manhattan. Or at least also in New York. Jeff in Manhattan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey. You've got a great show. I just wish you were able to get on more than you do. On more than I am, huh? Well, you know, uh, are you listening on the radio or do you only listen on the Internet? No, I, uh, I listen on both. I, I even do through Netflix. Ah, that's awesome. I think, uh, you know, I do, not only do I do this show Saturday and Sunday for three hours, that's six hours, I then do another 30 or 40 hours a week of programming. So to be honest, Jeff, I don't think I could do more than I'm doing. <laughs> oh, that's <a> real <laughs> But I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> I really do. Very much so. All, Thanks. In fact, all the other programs on there as well. Though. Yeah, we do. We have, uh, we have now 25, 30 programs on uh, my podcast network. It's become quite well, a work. Video as well. I mean, the video quality is pretty good, too. We've started offering, in the, in a, and it's a little concerning because it's uh, we've started offering high def, and it's huge. The files are like two gigabytes for the show. So I've got <laughs> we've got to figure out how we're going to handle that. But enough about me. You came here for some help. What can I do to help you, Jeff? Well, I recently started a website, and I have to image host part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I started on Squarespace, and I thought that Squarespace would store what I, what, what I call high-res images, only two, mega, two megabytes each. And I want to do a direct download as a customer vault. Ah, I can help you. I, I understand what you're asking, and I will help you when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, you may wonder what this sound is. This is Dead Mouse, who is not what you think it is. It's a, spelled with a five instead of an S. Does that help? No. He's a, um, what do you call him, Kyle? He's a electronic DJ. music DJ uh, who wears a mouse head, a big plastic mouse head. And he's very popular right now. And this is a performance he did in London, Millbank, actually, in England. Uh, as an ad for the Nokia Lumia 800 phone. They projected amazing graphics on the building behind him. Of course, there's a lot of... Um, uh, there's a live audience, and he's there spinning the discs. You can see it on YouTube if you search for Dead Mouse with a 5 instead of an S. And Nokia. And uh, it's actually a clever ad because you're there, you're enjoying it, you're listening to the music, and you don't get the Nokia ad until the very, very end. But it's an ad for the new Lumia 800, a phone that is uh, not available in the U.S. yet, but will be, we now know, probably uh, in uh, February or March. It is a Windows mobile phone, this new Windows Phone 7, 775, though, ma the latest version, which is actually quite good. I really like it. And uh, it is going to be quite a spectacular phone. It, uh, the, it they'll be calling it, I think, the uh, 900 Lumia 900, uh, because it will be different than the 800 in, in uh, that's available right now in Europe. Uh, running Windows uh, Phone, but uh, but also um, uh, with it, very nice hardware, great camera. Nokia is known for their great camera. Not sure uh, which carrier. I think it's Verizon, but I'm not sure. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. But that should be a very popular phone. Uh, when it comes out next spring. Of course, by then, who knows <laughs> what we'll be using, right? I, uh, I, have just, I have so many phones at this point because there are so many good phones out. In fact, I'm waiting for what many consider to be the hottest phone. We, I now believe it'll be December 9th that the Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy Nexus will come out on Verizon. December 9th is Friday. Uh, it will be a 4G phone using Verizon's LTE network. Probably at least 250 bucks, if not more, with a new contract. It should be very expensive. Um, and people are very excited about it, primarily because it's the first phone to use Google's new ice cream sandwich operating system. And those who have used it say it's a beautiful phone, very big screen. It's 1280 by 720. It's funny. I mean, that's bigger than most computers I had up until recently. I mean, it's a big screen, big resolution. Looks really nice. And uh, to, to, to people who have it already, and there are some, are raving about it. I ordered it from a, a, a vendor in England uh, last week, and I had hoped I was going to review it on the show uh, this week, and I just uh, didn't get it. They were back ordered. It is currently stuck at a FedEx location in Champaign, Illinois. Oh, well.
We were talking to Jeff in Manhattan. He uh, has a Squarespace site. And but what he wants to do is make it possible for people to download. He wants to embed the full quality of the image and make it possible for people to download it. Is that right? I've already done that. Now my question is this: Okay, SaintJoyTeacher.com is on Squarespace. Now there's an online store that has one line of code called Photomoto. I put that in there. Now through them, you have an auto pick option to do a direct download after a client buys something. Got it. So this is a way for you to sell your images. Right. Even by direct download, or I can they can buy prints through Photomoto. But the direct download is what I really want, so they can do uh, iron-on transfers from it. Uh -huh. Now. They don't want to host the high-res images, ah. so I went to Amazon S3 just for the storage. Okay, but now I couldn't get access to the Amazon S3. Right. Until can I, I recommend? Can I make a recommendation instead of Photomoto? That well, will, they will store the high quality. They'll even store the raw if you want. Make it available for download. Who would that be? Smug Mug. Mug, mug, S M. What are you laughing at? S M U G, M U G. Uh, very similar to Photomoto. It is a, a, a high-end professional photographers often use it. Photo storage site that uh, makes available for sale your photo and your photo on other things and so forth. And I, now I'm I'm pretty sure they, by the way, use Amazon S3. I'm pretty sure that they would make it fairly simple. It's not free. Photomoto, I guess, has a free version. Smug Mug, you'll want the pro account for the sales, and I think that's something like $140 a year. But it is, it is well worth it. And since you're making money on this, uh, I would I would expect that this would be worth uh, the money. At least try try. They have very good customer service. An email to Smug Mug, um, and that's by the way the advantage of a paid service versus a free service. They're going to give you better uh, support. Uh, an email to Smug Mug, their support team, and just say, tell them what you want to do, and I'm almost certain they will give you a way to do it. It's fantastic. Uh, if you want to see what Smug Mug looks like, one of the things that I like about Smug Mug is that uh, you can, Smug Mug will host all your images and even make a site that is identical. So if you go to my personal site, leoville.com, there's a design to that site. And then if you go in the Photos tab to Smug Mug, it'll look like you're still on my site. You're, in fact, on Smug Mug because it, essentially I pasted the design code for my site into Smug Mug's uh, servers. And so they're hosting the photo gallery, but it looks as if it's part of my page. And many, many pro photographers do this. I think it's well worth it. They also store RAWs uh, so you can have full, not just, you know, high-quality JPEGs, but full-quality raw images uh, and more. I, I don't imagine that you want to do that for T-shirt transfers, but it w I, you know they will do that, and that's why I think pros often use it. We're going to take a break. Come back. David from Irvine, California, is looking for the best way to uh, plug his Kickstarter. Well, I know what he wants to do. He wants to talk about it on the radio, and you know what? I'll let you because I want to tell you, show everybody what Kickstarter is capable of. It's very interesting. Uh, we are putting in the show notes information, thanks to Dr. Mom, on how to configure iCloud to work on Android devices. I don't know if they changed the servers or not, but uh, you can use your me.com or your mac.com address on Android phones. The IMAP server is a little weird, p07-imap.mail.me.com. Port 993, security type SSL, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a good article on santosh.wordpress.com, and uh, he's got all the details there. And this, this works pretty well. This works pretty well. He says you might have to change the password on your iCloud account if the above settings don't work. For some servers, this has solved the problem. So you'll see there's lots of comments about this worked, this didn't work, how to do it. It is, I guess, a little bit more difficult. So for Peter in Manhattan who was trying to figure out, how the heck do I get iCloud, my, my me.me mail, working on my Android phone? You can with a little jumping through some hoops. I don't think, I think Apple probably isn't, you know, they don't really care. They say, what are you using that Android for? We don't like Android, they say. Uh, David in Irvine, California, what's your Kickstarter? What are you doing? Yeah. Thanks for taking my call. Sure, David. Um, well, my father and I, about a year ago, we got into a little 
uh, business together. We started. We we uh, created an invention for uh, smartphones. And uh, I've heard you talk about Kickstarter several times. So uh, we went in and uh, we've launched a uh, launched a campaign. So tell tell me uh, how do I find it on Kickstarter? It's called Handable. H A N D A B L E. And uh, I believe you just do a search for that. Or you go to handable.net. We have a link to the Kickstarter. All right. Well, hang on. I have to take a break. I'm going to take a look at it. We'll talk more when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the Internet, cell phones, and camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, all that jazz. Phone number 888 8 Two seven five five three six toll free from anywhere in the U.S. Outside the U.S., you can Skype in. Toll free number won't cost you a penny. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. We were talking uh, uh, with David in Irvine, California. He and his dad have an invention, and they've created a Kickstarter page to raise money for it. The invention is called Handable. H A N D A B L E. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It's a, a hold the phone thing. Exactly. Okay, so else, let me. Else in the world like it. Yeah, so uh, you know, yeah. here's the the thing I find interesting about Kickstarter. It's a website where you go to raise money for an idea, and people can visit Kickstarter.com. They can either search for your idea or just browse around at Kickstarter and look at some of the projects. And if they feel like, gee, I'd like to support this, pro oh, this is a good idea. The best known one was a wristband, a wristband for uh, the uh, iPod Nano that turned it into a wristwatch. And they raised a ton of money on Kickstarter, enough money to manufacture the device. And then usually the way it works is depending on how much you donate to the project, you'll either get, you know, a commemorative T-shirt or you might even get one of these. So let's see what you're doing. Uh, for you pledge a dollar, you get uh, you get their thanks. <laughs> Matt says thank you. You pledge fifteen dollars, you'll get one. You'll get a handable. If you pledge twenty dollars or more, you get uh, your choice of colors. You pledge thirty dollars or more, you get a couple of them, and and on and on and on. Now the deal is, you don't have to give them any money until they reach their goals. So you, it looks like David, you set a goal of fifteen thousand dollars. That's right. Is that how much it would cost to kind of put this thing into production? Yeah, to get the first production run going and uh, the packaging and all of that, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's where you you kind of set the amount. Now the key is, of course, as you've already sussed, you you got to raise fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe not easy to do. You've got eight hundred thirty six dollars, but you got but you set a time limit, so you have a month to go. And so if by uh, uh, December thirty first, uh, fifteen thousand is pledged. Then all of those pledges suddenly cash in. All the people who, because what to pledge, you have to give them a credit card, so that they'll automatically be billed on December thirty first, and they'll get whatever premium you 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 said you'd give to them. So Kickstarter does this kind of all pretty straightforwardly. They have a like button, a tweet button, an embed button, and now it's now the question is, well, how do I get people to know about it? And I think one of the reasons that I like Kickstarter is uh, because. It's a good way of measuring the market. You don't have to spend anything on a handable unless enough people want it that makes it worthwhile. So board games are here. It's usually creative projects. I've seen documentaries here. Um, there's just a, there's a variety of different things. Here's a guy very close to reaching his goal. He wants to make a docking station for the MacBook Air. And he was looking for fifty grand. He's got forty nine thousand five hundred ninety dollars. <laughs> He's close, but until it hits fifty, it doesn't kick in. I, I like Kickstarter. There are a number of other uh, sites like this. There's you know Fund My Idea and stuff, but Kickstarter is kind of the best known. We actually approached them for when I was building this studio, this new studio that I'm in. You don't have to be a nonprofit or a individual. You can, you know, you can do any creative project. Uh, they they declined to. Uh, to uh, list us, we were trying to raise money for the studio. We wanted to sell bricks, and they said, "No, we don't want you know, we don't want to do that." But it's worth an approach. How hard was it to uh, get involved, David? Is actually uh, the process was fairly easy uh, to get involved with Kickstarter. We submitted the application, I believe, within 24 hours. We were uh, accepted. Do you, and then it's it's typical that you make a, a video. 
right. Did, is right, that yeah. part of the process of application that they want to see a video, or or do you do that after the fact? Well, we did that uh, before we had even thought about Kickstarter, but uh, we threw our video in there. When since looking at all of the other campaigns, everybody has everybody a has a video, and I think that's that's yeah. kind of critical because that lets the potential investors uh, know how it's going to work. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, our video contains a prototype, of course, and, <laughs> you know, uh, as, as much as I can show of it. So. Uh, yeah, and that's the other issue, isn't it? Because, uh, you, <laughs> well, your prototype looks real, so that's good. It's a, what is this, it a is, little, it's it a little knob that's uh, attached to the back of the phone that lets you hold it in your hand. That's, that's a clever idea. I like that. So really what's going to happen now is you, you've certainly publicized it here. Um, if it's something people like, they will pledge the money, you know. Um, and if it's not, then they won't. And so it's a very good way before you've made one of them. You put, you put effort into the prototype. You put effort into the idea and the video and everything. But before you've even made one, you, you know. And I think this is one of the issues uh, with uh, innovation in general. Creating a new product is a very costly process. And it's very difficult to know whether you'll make money. We talk about this all the time with uh, our gadget guy, Dick Bartolo. He asks uh, a new. He meets, he meets all these guys because you know they want him to publicize his their gadgets, and he asks them. And in general, it, it's often as much as a hundred thousand dollars just to make that first production run, out of your pocket. And most of them fail. So Kickstarter is really kind of a neat idea. It's a chance for somebody who's got a great idea to put it out there, see if there's a market for it, and even you know get investors. So that it, it doesn't have to come out of your pocket. There's still expenses. You know, you're going to have to, you know, patent the idea if it's patentable. And, uh, you, you know, one production run isn't going to do it if you want to keep doing it. But it certainly is a good way to get started. I think this is one of, the, one of the ways that the Internet is really transforming the economy in a, in a positive way in this case. By making it possible for an inventor uh, to get started in a in a much less costly, much more friction free uh, way. Um, so I, I, we'll give you a plug, David. And if somebody's interested, they should they should pledge H A N D A B L E, like hand able. And if you just Google uh, what I did was handable and Kickstarter, I just Google those two words and I found it right away. Good luck, David. I think that's great. We'll check in in a, in a month and see how you how you've done. Francis, New Bedford, Massachusetts, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Fantastic. Got a great show. Thanks, Francis. Uh, I spent a lot of time watching you at night. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because it's dark? No, I can't sleep. I'm retired. I know, I know the feeling. I wake up at 2 every morning. It's a perfect time for podcasts. <laughs> um, what I, the problem I have is uh, we went on a trip with the family and... I had three cameras, and everybody was taking pictures. And so I put them all in one folder, and now what I want to do is I want to get them in a certain order in another folder so that I can then download it onto an iPad or, or whatever, whatever. Got it. Mac or PC? Uh, PC. So, uh, actually, it looks like you're already using Picasa. Yeah, but I haven't figured out how to do it. <laughs> So Picasa is like most photo album programs. It's the one I recommend because it's free, P-I-C-A-S-A dot com. And it, uh, the nice thing about Picasa is, as with most photo albums, there's a, a, a range, you can arrange stuff. And so you can make a, what you want to do is make a slideshow, Francis, and put them in order, uh, right? And then once you've put it in order, I'm sorry, go ahead. You'll put it in order in the slideshow, right? Yeah, but then I cannot view that, uh, you know, um, how can I say this? Uh, we did make a slideshow with uh, Movie Maker, okay? okay? We'll do it with Picasa. Okay, but can I get him in the folder in the order that I want it? Um, so that you just browse the folder and it's in the right order? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's, see, that's, Picasa won't help you with that. That's a Windows thing. And no, the answer is basically no. Windows is going to sort it. So that's why you use a program like Picasa to order it within Picasa to a slideshow. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 
8888. Ask Leo. Get back to the phones here. Let's see. Our next call from Fresno, California. Greg's on the line. Hi, Greg. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, run over to the phone. <laughs> now, I have to explain. It's not Greg's fault. We keep these people on hold for a really long time. My theory being that most of the time they'll fix their problem before I have to answer the uh, call. Greg, did you fix your problem? Uh, unfortunately, no, I didn't fix it. Okay. Problem. All right. So that's that, then you've qualified to <laughs> get on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking my call. I, I bought an Optiplex 980 from Dell. Okay. And when I bought it, they told me I could use it as a server. It's got the i5 chipset, mm -hmm. 16 megs of RAM. 16 is a lot. Wow. 16 yeah. gigs, I presume. Yeah. So I just want to be able to hook up a couple of extra terminals and be able to access it in remote parts of my office. Is that possible? or am I going uh, to See, when you say server... To, We're not going to do any hosting. Yeah, to Dell. What they're thinking of is exactly that. They're thinking web server uh, or a kind of server like that, an Internet-type server. What you really wanted, uh, and it'll do this, but, what, but I can understand the confusion. You want kind of an old-fashioned centralized computer with a bunch of terminals. Couple of terminals, yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, terminals are so cheap that most people uh, kind of just say one CPU per user. But you can do this. Uh, is it? Are, are multiple terminals going to be used simultaneously? Possibly. Yeah. See, we're shipping in a different part of the. You know, I've got a warehouse where I've got a shipping. Where I'd, it would help if I had a shipping terminal. I'll, I'll tell you how we do this, and it's not what you're thinking. I mean, I, you know, this is this goes back to the old days of kind of multi-user computing, uh, mainframe and terminal, uh, you know, client-server computing, which is different, a little different from the kinds of servers we talk about nowadays. Um, I would say most companies that do this now don't, in fact, use dumb terminals. They'll use inexpensive computers and remote access to do this. The access, though, what do you? Well, you do it over the uh, land-based remote access works quite well. It's quite fast. So uh, if they're all Windows machines, you can, you know, they, it comes built in, you know, the remote desktop protocol so that you can access that central Windows machine from any Windows machine that's on the same LAN. Uh, you might be able to get a, a thin client that's cheaper. Let me just... Um, because there are thin clients that can run uh, remote Windows remote desktop. Wise and others yeah, I make just those. Buy standalone desktops and then. That's what I would do. That's certainly well. Let me put it this way. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. If I need to access, a, we have a number of, for instance, all of our Skype machines. We do uh, Skype calls a lot. Are in the basement, and if I want to make a Skype call, I use uh, remote access to make the call over the LAN to that network machine, network machine. But there are thin clients that'll do this. This is, you know, I think that this was a disconnect when you talked to Dell. Again, they probably thought you meant an internet server. You want a uh, a, a LAN server, a client server in, uh, over the LAN. Um, and I can understand that you would basically want a centralized database. This is really an old-fashioned way to do it. My recommendation, since it's a business, Greg, is to get a consultant in there to set that up. If you have multiple people, for instance, using the same Excel spreadsheet, you're going to screw it up because it needs to be locked. But Microsoft does have good solutions for this SharePoint, remote desktop, that kind of thing. You need a, a Windows uh, expert in there. A LAN, you know, I would bring in an IT consultant to set this up because it's easy to screw it up. And probably the best thing to do would have done to have got that person in there before you bought the hardware. But I think given what you've purchased, which is a pretty high-end machine, you should be all right. Another way to do that would be to do uh, sharing the data over the Internet and having multiple small, inexpensive computers accessing something like Google Docs or SharePoint. There are lots of ways to solve this, but I really do think this is one for a, a business IT consultant. Matt in Torrance, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm very well. What can I do for you? Thank you uh, for taking my call. My pleasure. I'm looking for some recommendations for a laptop to sort of replace a desktop. I'm setting up a home office in a spare bedroom of the house that will be my own probably three-fourths of the time. 
but I'll have to abandon it when my uh, daughter's home from school during the summer and it breaks. So I'm. <laughs> I do the same thing. I have my. I basically use my daughter's bedroom as my home office until she comes home. Right. So I'm thinking <laughs> if I <laughs> if I get a laptop, that'll enable me to jump out, work out of the dining room or whatever, right. you know, for long stretches of time. But the vast majority of the time, it will be at the office. Uh, in the little office area, I do want to have it set up with uh, uh, an external monitor and a regular keyboard and all of that stuff. Yeah, but see, that's the way to do it. Uh, is is and most laptops will do this now. Is you have the laptop when you sit down at the desk in your daughter's room, where you can have a 27-inch monitor and speakers and a nice keyboard and mouse. You just hook. You you know, in the old days we would dock these. Uh, you right. just hook it up to that, and uh, and you're done. Now, Mac, Apple makes this very easy. I don't know if you're using Apple or Windows. Well, I have to use. It. I have to be able to run Windows because some of the software that I use for the work that I do is only available in Windows. I have had some people say you should get a MacBook and run Windows on it. That's the best way to go. I'm a little skeptical, but I'm I'm open to that if that was the best suggestion. The, it's not the, the cheapest suggestion. Out. It works. I mean, I run Windows on my Macs all the time because I'm playing. Uh, a game called Skyrim that I, I'm totally addicted to that only runs on Windows. So I'll reboot my Macs into Windows, and they're pretty good uh, Windows machines. It's, but you're paying a lot more because you're buying a Mac instead of a PC. Um, Apple does make this very easy because their laptops now have something called Thunderbolt. So what happens is you buy a Apple monitor. It has one cable coming off of it with a Thunderbolt connector and a power connector. When you sit down, you connect the power because the monitor is powered also, so you don't have to plug in. You just connect to the monitor. It gives you power. The Thunderbolt then gives the U. Is the monitor has USB ports. It has Ethernet. It has all the jacks you want. And so, and and this, and you don't even have to open the laptop. And this is one of the things Apple's done very well. Is the laptop senses the monitor and says, "Oh, I am in desktop mode," and you don't even have to open the laptop. It just works. So you can have a keyboard. You can have a mouse. Uh, and all you have to do is sit down and kind of attach these two little plugs and suddenly and put the laptop you know over on the side and suddenly you're on a desktop if 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 i were convinced that mac were far and away the best way to do windows i would probably it isn't it isn't and since you only want to run windows i'm not going to recommend that i'm just yeah, and i'd rather not have to buy a bunch of new hardware or a bunch of new software the main things i'm concerned with is it's got to be bulletproof running like 18 hours a day it's got to have good well, speed not on battery 18 hours a day right no, 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 no. Oh, okay. I just mean it's got to be able to run and run and run without failing. Yeah, any modern computer is going to run without failing. And Windows 7 is very reliable. That's not going to be an issue. Okay. Um, it's got to have uh, decent speed. I usually have 10 or 12 applications open at a time, including 6, 8, 7, 6, 8, whatever, 10. So for that, you want a lot of RAM. You might want to look at a solid-state drive as well as a spinning okay. hard drive for faster boot okay. times and faster load times. These are all things that can cost money. I would go, what I would do is go to Dell. Uh, Dell makes excellent laptops, and they make standalone monitors that will hook up to those laptops. I think that's probably the best solution. Get an i5-based system, and you're good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo's the number. If you're watching on video, you see we just had uh, Brent by my master lighting gaffer. <laughs> He's a gaffer from OceanStudio.com. Come in and make our put up our Christmas lights. It's nice when you're in a television studio. All you have to do is flip a switch, and now I'm red and green. Isn't that nice? And we have a uh, a little bug. Where's our bug? Our, oh, I know why we don't have a bug. We have a little Twit logo with a Christmas hat on it. It's a long story, but I know why it's not there. I can't really explain it to you now, but I'll I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Albert in San Francisco, Leo Laporte. I'm sorry, San Bernardino, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you very much for taking my call. I enjoy your show, and I love your voice. I wish you could uh, do the regular news every day. Well, I could. In fact, actually, we're talking with the syndicator about doing a daily tech uh, minute on uh, local stations all over the country. It would be kind of fun to do that. That would be very cool. You know what I really want to do, and I'm going to do this when I retire? Audiobooks. I've always wanted to do that. Nice. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> only my favorite books, though. So, well, thank you. That's very, you're very flattering. Thank you, Albert. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Um, well, my question, I know this is pretty much a softball question for you because uh, I'm sure you're used to fielding a, um, a lot bigger problems regarding uh, computers and stuff. But my question to you is I'm looking for a software. I recently bought an Asus Transformer. and I'm How do you like that, by the way? I love that. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I should I ask you first and then tell you. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't even opened it up. Uh, so the Transformer I, is a, a tablet, an Android tablet that docks into a, a, a keyboard and then becomes a laptop. Yes. And I would say this is the best Android tablet choice right now. I think they've got a new one coming out pretty soon. Uh, very nice stuff. Yes, well, I was one of the Black Friday shoppers out there. Good deal. And I pretty got a, I got a pretty good. How much? On. Tell me, tell me how much. Uh, two forty nine plus tax, two seventy five out. Oh, oh man, that includes the keyboard dock. Uh, no, it didn't include oh, okay. the keyboard. I kind of pass on that. Yeah, you know, I've always wondered why people get. Uh, I mean, then you might as well get a laptop. So you, you, you got the uh, the basically a, an Android tablet. Yes, sir. Yeah, dual core, gigahertz. It's mm -hmm. running Honeycomb now, although they say they'll put ice cream sandwich on it soon. Yeah, I, I think they upgraded um, the, um, I think it's running the 3.2, the tablet that right. I got. So. Right, yeah, I think that's the um, latest but version. I, I was actually looking for an antivirus that would protect me from, you know, antiviruses, malware that would scan uh, the apps. So let I me talk a little bit about that, because that is a very hot topic right now. There was a report just came out from a antivirus firm, a security firm, saying Android malware is up 246%. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of companies who sell security solutions for mobile devices who are ringing the alarm bell saying they're coming, the bad guys are coming. And, you know, I think it makes sense because this is a mobile device, so it's always connected. It's always on the Internet. It's got a lot of your information in it. There are lots of ways bad guys can use a cell phone if they've hacked it to make money, sending uh, expensive text messages, making phone calls to expensive numbers. There's all sorts of tricks. And yet, we really aren't seeing an onslaught of, uh, of malware on the mobile platforms. Why not, you might ask? Because mobile platforms are written more securely. Mm. Android iOS, BlackBerry, Windows Phone 7, when these operating systems were written, and they're much more modern than our desktop operating systems, the companies knew that these guys, this, these little things would be targets. So they did a lot to protect us with sandboxing, with locked kernels, with locked bootloaders. These are much more secure, inherently much more secure devices. And that's why we haven't seen this crazy onslaught of malware. Do not think of your smartphone as the same or your transformer, your, your, your Android tablet, as the same as a desktop. You don't need an antivirus scanner running in the background all the time. You don't want it either because you, resources are much more scant on these devices. So malware does leak in and, and, and certainly there are bad guys putting apps on the Android marketplace. Mm -hmm. Apple Apple fans might say, well, that's why we love Apple. No, they're also putting bad stuff in the Apple marketplace. It's Apple's scanning stuff, but it doesn't mean they're catching everything. In fact, we know they're not. So there is always this potential. But in both cases, the companies have what we call kill switches. So if bad stuff gets in your system, they can remotely push a button and delete that application. That's something that's unique in mobile platforms. Um, they are, of course, people are constantly looking at these programs if you buy android apps or download android apps from the android market and you don't get apps that are kind of sketch like 553 background wallpapers made just for you you're probably i'm sorry about the russian accent but <laughs> <I have laughs> you know they, they often come from eastern europe from bulgaria romania russia um those things, if you stay with China, if you stay away from those and you get, you know, mainstream, well-known apps, which is what you're going to do on a tablet, you don't have to worry. Now, having said that, there is a free program I like and I use. It's not exactly the same as a malware app that you'd see on a desktop, but it's available for free. So why not put it on there? It's called Lookout. Okay. And Lookout just is an extra little something that when you download software, it checks it. And mostly it's checking it until you know against a database of known problems by the time something is a known problem google's already flipped the kill switch almost certainly they've pulled it off the marketplace and they've deleted it from people's phones okay. i don't now, think you need anything more than what you got okay now look out does that come download it on on my tablet or i have to go into the android go to the android marketplace and search for it and you will see it okay and we're exactly in that because i'm pretty 
this is all new territory. So there's a search button. You see the magnifying glass. Just press that and type lookout. Okay. And you'll find it. Awesome. They Thank probably you. don't have a tablet version. They may. I don't know. I haven't checked. But even if they don't, it doesn't matter. It's because it's not something that the user interface matters uh, on. You just want it running in the background. Again, I don't think you need it. <laughs> I mean, but if but but it's you know I run it because it just makes me feel like well just in case, just in case why not? But truthfully, I think that the reason we haven't seen an onslaught, believe me, the bad guys would love to hack these mobile devices. These things these things are much more valuable than a desktop computer in terms of the raw amount of money they can make right away from it. Um, and they and they don't, and that's because these things I think are much more protected than a desktop. Lookout has some other nice features that I, uh, you know, you can find your phone. Although Android, you know, does that, iPhone does that, and so forth. People are more worried, I think, and and we talked about it at the beginning of the show, but I should mention it for those of you joining us about this carrier ID program. I'll mention it again just so that people know. I don't think it's something to worry about. Uh, a security researcher published his findings um, a couple of weeks ago and then uh, an update this week saying that Sprint and AT&T put something called Carrier ID on your phone. It's a software service that the carriers use to monitor in aggregate, not individually, but monitor in aggregate network usage so that they, and how people use their phones, how many apps they run at a time and stuff, so they can improve the phone. Carrier IQ, I'm sorry, thank you. Carrier IQ. The I, admittedly, uh, it would be nice if we had been told about this. It would be nice if we were uh, given a privacy policy that, uh, you know, let us know what was being collected and so forth. Trevor Eckhart, the researcher who discovered it, uh, claimed this week that it's monitoring keystrokes and sending them back to the Carrier IQ servers. Carrier IQ has denied this, and another researcher stepped forward saying that Trevor misinterpreted the debugger log that he was looking at, that it doesn't, in fact, do that. So we don't know exactly. Carrier IQ hasn't handled this very well. They probably should step forward and, and change their publicity, uh, public privacy policy, but I don't think it's anything to worry about. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I didn't know Elvis was into the Internet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. Back to the phones we go. And uh, Pam in Yorba Linda, California, listening on our mothership, KFI in Los Angeles. Hi, Pam. Hi, Leo. I'm so excited to talk Yay. to you. Happy holidays. And you, and thank, thank you. you so much for all the many great suggestions you've given me. I'm Over sure I've spent a lot of your money. You have, I'm but yeah, it's been great. We use all the go to my PC and go to assist oh, and good. Carbonite and all sorts of things oh, based on your recommendation. And wonderful, so. and you're happy. I'm very happy, good. very happy, yeah. Good. But today I'm not happy about another project that I'm working on, and I'm hoping you can help me with that. Um, I had my grandpa's 8 millimeter films converted to DVD by a service in Texas, and they did a really nice job, and I liked the DVDs, but they came in a, like, I don't know what you call it, TS format, I guess. And well, if you look at, if you examine a DVD, in order for a DVD, which is what they sent you, I guess, yes. in order for it to play on a DVD player, it has a very specific format defined. And you'll see on the DVD, if you look at it with uh, a computer, you'll see a bunch of files. That, as you said, the TS1 right. files, those are index files. You'll see .vob, VOB files. Right. That's a, that's a mashed up audio and video file. There'll be a bunch of stuff on there. Um, so I want to convert those into some kind of a, uh, a file like an AVI or something that I can import to Movie Maker because... He took, uh, you know, I want to kind of siphon out which families would be interested in. Yeah, you want to edit it. Yeah. So I bought a, a converter, uh, iCoolSoft uh, video converter, uh, but yeah. it only brings in seconds of the VOB. And uh, the, the here, DVD is hours long, and I get like yeah. eight seconds of film through my converter. Something's, something's so what do you there. recommend to do that? What is the procedure you would recommend to do that? I, I'll recommend the same program that I use to import commercial DVDs. It does a very good job. It gives you a lot of flexibility, and it's free. Okay. Yeah, so you've already bought something, but here's something that you don't have to buy. It's called Handbrake. Hand H break. Yeah, just like a handbrake in your car, H-A-N-D-B-R-A-K-E. Okay. And, and the website is handbrake.fr. F-R. 
Yeah, it's, it's Windows brand. or Mac. Now, here's the deal on Handbrake. Um, it has a lot of settings, and you can and probably would want to set it to the maximum possible quality because you then want to edit it and so forth. The VOB contains MPEG-2 video. That's the format that DVDs are compressed into. So, but, but I think the easiest thing to do is to rip this, which is what this program does. It takes the data from the DVD, puts it on your hard drive, in the process, transcoding it into a format that you can edit with Windows Movie Maker. Okay. And um, I'm always a little nervous about the free software. You, so I, I don't blame you, but this is one I can safely okay. recommend. Okay. Now, if it's got, uh, and I sh this is, a, they'll tell you in the Handbrake uh, website, but if you have a encrypted DVD, a commercial DVD, yours probably are not. No, no. Huh? But if you have, a, you know, a movie you want to encrypt, you'll need an additional program called VLC from Videoland.org. Um, okay. But but you don't for just your movies, you don't need that. Handbrake okay. is excellent. I I've and been using Handbrake for years. What format do you, would you convert them to? I mean, because there's like a million different choices once you start converting. Yeah, what so there's a wrapper, which is the AVI, other wrappers are MOV for QuickTime, and that's actually not the codec. Inside the wrapper, there is uh, a compressed file using a, a, a particular compression technology. We call those codecs, compressor, decompressor. Okay. The codec, the, it's, the VOB file, by the way, is the wrapper. Inside that VOB wrapper is a MPEG-2 video oh. codec, code, and AAC audio. So there's different codecs for audio and video. And you can, in fact, it'd probably be best to use the same format. That, that way you're not transcoding it, so you're doing a minimal uh, amount of processing. So, so stay with an MPEG then, MPEG-2? Yeah, if it gives you that option. I'm not sure. I haven't used it on Windows, so I'm not sure. I'm sorry, it's AC3, okay. not AAC. So, okay. um, so and, and you'll, but I think you'll have no trouble creating an AVI that you can then open up in uh, Windows Movie Maker. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I My appreciate it. My pleasure, Pam. Thank you. I think it's a great project. There are other converters. Uh, Pam ELZ is recommending one that I've used before I like called Videora. V-I-D-E-O-R-A, and they have a variety of different uh, transcoders. This is a very common issue where you have video in one format and you want it in another format. Their, uh, their transcoding is changing the compression, the codec, from one to another. And then you may also change the wrapper. There are a number of wrappers. As I said, there's AVI, MOV. She's got VOB. There's also MKV, Matroshka. There are a lot of different wrappers that will hold inside them the video. In the case of the VOB file, it's holding audio and video together. It's mushing them together. Um, it's, it's, it's unnecessarily complex, I understand. Um, welcome to the wacky world of computing. Fortunately, audio is it's much simpler. You know, there's MP3, and that's pretty much, that's pretty much it, AAC. There are a few other formats, but uh, there are a couple of very, very, very common formats. Video, unfortunately, they're, they're, it's much more complex. Of course, it's video. It's got us a lot more to store. Uh, let's take a break, and then we're going to talk to Jonathan. He's calling from Melbourne, Florida, looking for a camera, a point-and-shoot that takes great pictures. <laughs> I have some very good recommendations, actually. But we've got some great cameras out these days. Jonathan, Melbourne, Florida, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great, Jonathan. Thanks for calling. You know, i got to tell you, you've uh, recommended my laptop, the X220. Very happy with that. Yay. You recommended uh, Text Aloud, the text-to-speech uh, yeah, text software. Very happy with that. Great. You've really changed the way I do my work, and I really appreciate oh, you. My pleasure, Jonathan. How do you like that so, X220? That's the that beautiful ThinkPad. Very fast. Very nice. It's very, very nice. Yeah. Um, I've had a few minor problems with it, but that's just operator error. That's not the computer. <laughs> well, so. it, you know, I'm one thing, and I always say this, it's not your fault. If the computer lets you make an error, then it's the computer's fault. But, uh, all right, well, well, we'll give it that. It, these sure. are beautiful notebooks. And you know who I should give credit to? Cory Doctorow, the science fiction author, who uses these and recommended it. He's, he's a big fan. So, what can I do to help you now? So, I've turned to you now. I need to buy a, a high-quality point-and-shoot camera, but here's the thing. 
It's got to be small enough to fit in my backpack, and it's got to make my pictures look like they were taken by someone who actually knows what the heck they're doing. <laughs> All right, the because smallest I don't, I don't best have a camera at all. All right, the smallest best digital camera out there I know of is the Canon PowerShot S100. You, they actually it's the successor to the S95. The S100 just came out. You may be uh, able to find the S95 easier. That's just as good and it will be a little you know, less expensive. I was just looking, I was just looking at that online. I like the little ring that they have you can use to focus with. Yep. It makes me look more like a photographer. This is many pros carry this as their back, you know, every pro has a point and shoot they carry around. This is a very good choice. I have some other recommendations, interchangeable lens cameras and stuff. We'll talk about the best digital camera for you when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, ready to talk with you about technology, computers and the Internet, smartphones, digital photography, home theater even. 8888 Ask Leo is the number. If you're a home theater fan, by the way, next weekend, Saturday and Sunday, Scott Wilkinson holds down the fort. He's our home theater expert. I'm going to be in Paris for the Le Web conference. Yes, that's what they call it, Le Web. And <laughs> we'll be covering that all week on my uh, podcast network. Hey, I know it's Paris, but it's an important event. You know, i got to cover that. Uh, so I won't be here next weekend, but uh, hey, no better guy to replace me than Scott Wilkinson. He'll talk about home theater. So if you've got home theater questions next weekend, that's when you should uh, call in. We were talking about photography, digital photography, uh, as we wrapped up the hour last hour. And uh, we were talking to, uh, oh, I don't remember his name, but um fellow was getting his first digital camera. He wanted one that made him, would make him look like a better photographer. Now, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, um, if you're a good photographer, it doesn't even really matter. <laughs> I've seen, uh, you know, Great pictures taken with camera phones by photo it's the it's the photographer, not the camera. In other words, and then and I have to say the iPhone uh, four and four S particularly are excellent cameras, and uh, and for many people replace uh, the point and shoot, but they lack a few things. There's no zoom, no no optical zoom, um, and and uh, the quality is probably a little less than something like the camera I recommended he get, which is the Canon Power Shot, either the S95 or if you can find it, its successor, the S100. List price about 500 bucks on these, but uh, you should be able to find them for 400 or less. If you get a little more serious, you might be looking at an interchangeable camera system, and there's something that's kind of become very popular right now um, as an intermediate to the very pricey digital SLR cameras like the Canon, Nikon, uh, you know, the T2i, or the T3i from Canon, the Nikon, um, oh, is it the D, what is the, is it the D70, the D90? It's popular right now, the D7000. Those cameras are very, you know, thousands of dollars with lenses, even at the entry level. I think the uh, T3i is around $800 with a lens. But there's this uh, a system called the Micro Four Thirds system that is kind of a compromise between the high-end, bigger, bulkier, more expensive digital SLRs and the more compact, less expensive compact point-and-shoots. And that's this Micro Four Thirds system. And a number of companies, uh, Panasonic, Fuji, Olympus, make cameras that use this micro four thirds system and there's one that i i'm really liking a lot it's a little pricey called the uh, ep3 from olympus the pen system they're good looking fairly small cameras because this they don't that unlike a digital slr they don't have a big mirror assembly they can be smaller the uh, the p3 is is the fastest focusing camera i've ever seen it does really nice job with images it's kind of in between so I would take a look at I would take a look at the S100 if you want something with interchangeable lenses, which means you can get wide angle, long lenses, telephoto, that kind of thing. Um, I would take a look at perhaps the Olympus Pen EP3. The four third sensor is a little smaller though than say something like the um, the T3i, and the bigger the sensor, the bigger the better the image. So if you want to get kind of serious about photography, my recommendation would be the Canon T3 or T2 or T3i. Those are really excellent.
excellent cameras. There's a lot of good stuff out there for under a thousand bucks. But I think if you're if you're if it's your first digital camera, you don't know yet if you're a very serious photographer, you want pictures for the holidays, maybe travel pictures, and you want something really compact you can fit in your breast pocket, then I think the S100 is excellent. Let's go to the Netherlands. Jack's calling via Skype. Hi, Jack. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Thanks for listening. Yes, well, I'm listening using your Twitch TV website. Marvelous. Uh, I have a question. Uh, no, first I have to congratulate you to congratulate you with your birthday. Thank you. 55 on uh, uh, last Thursday. Or last Tuesday, I guess. Yes. Well, I, I have a small question. I'm, uh, I have an iPod and... No, sorry. I have an iPad and an iPhone, and my computers are running Windows. So I have to use iTunes. But iTunes on Windows is not a very good program. <laughs> it's widely loathed by everybody. <laughs> everybody hates <laughs> iTunes on Windows. Yes, so I'm looking for an alternative. Yeah, there are several uh, alternatives. Um, ultimately, you're going to need iTunes anyway for things like updating the operating system. Apple only allows that through iTunes. Once you get to iOS 5, you can do it over the air. But iTunes, you know, you're not going to get rid of iTunes. But if you want something better for organizing your, your, your music, syncing your music up and so forth, there are a number of very good uh, choices. I like Songbird. Um, that's a, a free program from GetSongbird.com. Yes. Uh, there's another one that I've recommended for years called Media Monkey that uh, is really excellent, also free. Uh, both of these do pretty much the same things that iTunes uh, does. And then there's a kind of a newer one that comes from a, a guy you may know of called DVD John. He's a... Uh, He's uh, from uh, Scandinavia, I think Norway. He was the guy who cracked the CSS encryption on DVDs, and he's since grown up. He was a high school kid when he did that. And he has a company called Double Twist and makes, a, I think, a really nice music player. Uh, I started using it on Android. Uh, but it also, I believe, works with uh, iPods, and it does over-the-air sync and things like that. It's also free. So those are three choices. DoubleTwist.com, GetSongbird.com, or MediaMonkey.com. And I think any of those three would probably be better on Windows than iTunes. You'll still need iTunes for some things, but, it, you know, backing up and so forth. Uh, but I think that these are better choices for just managing music okay. and syncing and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Really great to talk to you, and thank you for... Uh, Listening, I, I should underscore for people uh, who don't know that we have a very large international audience. About a third of our audience is overseas, outside the U.S. I guess it's not always overseas. Canada is not over any sea, but outside the U.S. And uh, they, they mostly listen on the Internet. And you can do the same if you go to our website, techguylabs.com. No charge. We just, we just want you to listen. Let's go to Redding, California. David next. David Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Um, first, I'd like to say that I started listening to Twit back before you guys had a name. And <laughs> when when, when we started the podcast, we had a name, but it was uh, but we were sued, so <laughs> <laughs> That's true. we had to change it. Okay, so I've got a um, I've got kind of a strange issue. It appears that uh, adding a fairly fast 4 gig SD card to my EPC is actually making it run slower. And I was kind of wondering if maybe you had a solution for that or a suggestion to maybe... So you wanted to use... Microsoft has this thing called Ready Boost where you use an SD card as a... Um, it caches uh, temp files, things it needs for boot, and supposedly it will speed up boot times. You know, it's funny. They made a big deal about that when it came out, and I haven't heard a thing about it ever since. And I don't even know if they offer it on the new Windows 8. I don't know if they're going to do Ready Boost. You do have to have fast SD RAM, fast flash card. It may be that you don't have a fast enough card. Okay. So getting a faster um, yeah. card may help. Now, it's want... got, I've maxed it out at 2 gigs of, of RAM in the, in the computer. Right. That's a, and... Netbooks can only go to 2 gigs. So 
one website I've, I've seen says that, okay, there's nothing I can do past two gigs. And others say, yeah, it's an artificial limitation that uh, Intel introduced because they didn't want their Atom processor to cannibalize their big processor. So you're stuck. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. When I get to Paris. Yes. I'll be leaving for Paris uh, on Monday for Le Web. I love how uh, the French incorporate uh, American words like weekend and sweater. <laughs> le web, le weekend. So they call it le web. And it's a conference. Actually, it's a fun conference where uh, U.S.-based entrepreneurs go to Paris to meet uh, European entrepreneurs. And it's a fairly large conference. We'll be uh, covering it live early in the morning on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday on my podcast network, twit.com. TV. Let's go to North Hollywood. Larry, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Larry. I have a question. My roommate and I share a, have a laptop when we share the same Wi-Fi wireless mm -hmm. CSL modem. But in the connection where I seem to be stalling when viewing a web page. So you're on different uh, machines. His works nice and fluidly, and yours does not. Yes, I have a NetTop, and he, he has a Mac. Well, there's a big difference right there. The netbooks uh, are very much slower processors. We're just talking about that. <laughs> Intel put an Atom processor. Actually, they created a special low-power, low-performance chip called the Atom, uh, so that it wouldn't compete with their high-end stuff. They didn't want to uh, reduce sales of the high-end computers. That's, of course, what's in the Macintosh. Apple never made a netbook. And the reason Apple, as Steve Jobs said, we never made them is because they're crappy. Steve said, we don't want to make a netbook. We don't think they're, you know, th we think they're, they're cheap, but they're also uh, poorly made. And I think you perhaps are seeing... It's, it's not necessarily the case, but I would suspect that that's one of the reasons you're seeing a big difference in performance. Web pages, it's not just the speed of the Internet access. Those pages have to be rendered by the computer. They have to be drawn. Uh, so scrolling might be slow. Loading might be slow. Uh, all of that. Apple does make, in effect, a netbook. They make the iPad. That was what they felt was a more appropriate device for a low price point than, uh, than these inexpensive netbooks. And I have to say, uh, you don't see a lot of netbooks anymore, and that's for good reason. Um, people bought them, and uh, this happens every, it's happened many times in the computer industry, going way back, and don't get mad at me when I say this, to the VIC-20 computer Commodore made uh, in the 70s, I guess it was, maybe early 80s. Very cheap computer. A lot of people thinking, well, we need a computer for the kids, you know, 1981, went out and bought VIC-20s, and they were so underpowered with so little memory. I think they had four kilobytes of RAM at the time that they, they ended up in the closet collecting dust. And I think the same thing has happened ever since, that to respond to demand for inexpensive computers, companies have made them. But in general, people who buy inexpensive computers end up not using them because they're so horrible. <laughs> they're so unusable. Vic twenty TI ninety nine four A remember that the um, even the Commodore sixty four uh, weren't fantastic because they just didn't have they you know they were cheap they didn't have enough horsepower so Larry I suspect it's probably the uh, you, you know the issue is this inexpensive hardware you're using and there's maybe not a lot more you can do with that. Get if you get it, it, one way to test this would be to get a wire out of the wireless access point. You know they can't; they'll all have at least one Ethernet jack. Plug that into your netbook. See how it works when it's wired. If it works fine when it's wired, uh, it could be a bad Wi-Fi adapter. It could be the antenna doesn't work well in this small device. It could be a lot of other things. So try it wired first. See how it works. If it's still performing poorly, then it's just you know the hardware. Ursula in Pasadena, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Ursula. Hi, Leo. How are you today? Fantastic. How are you? Great. Wonderful. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I work for a consulting firm, and we therefore receive a lot, a lot of documents and big banker's boxes from our various clients. And so basically, we have a scanner. It's an image runner um, 
I think it's a 5650. I don't, I'm not at work, so I can't really look at the model right now. But it's a Canon image runner, and it's a copier and a scanner, and we already obviously can scan on it. But we're trying to figure out if there's a good application or a good piece of software out there that will work with our database, which our client database is access, because we'd like to be able to scan our documents and then uh, label them and name them and be able to sort them and, you know, also to link them to our access database um, so that we can remotely, you know, go into our system and look up any possible document we may have received on a particular case. Boy, I wish I could help you. This is uh, way well beyond my ken. Um, really? Yeah, I'm sorry. I really cover consumer computing, and this is, uh, you need a high-end, I understand what you want, and I'm, and yeah. I'm sure many things exist okay. that will, will work. You have a sheet feed scanner. It's automated, right? Yes, it is automated. Yeah. So you put yeah. that stack of documents in the sheet feeder, you press right. go, and what you want it to do is scan them, probably do optical character recognition or OCR. Right. And then right. say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort this stuff into the database according to keywords, according to what the information says. Yeah, uh, something like that. I mean, obviously it already scans for us, but we'd like to be able to, I guess the word will be integrated with, yeah. with our access database. You don't want to do as much manual processing as you're probably doing. You get a PDF right. and you go, okay, that goes there, okay, that goes there, well, cut and paste there. even if we don't scan it, we have to type in a label of what that document is. Right. And, save it on our, you know, on is our it, Is it a law office, Ursula? It's not a law office, but we work for attorneys, so okay. we're very much set up like a law firm. Tends to be legal documents, pleadings, yeah. that kind of thing? That th exactly. Yeah. There are certainly, and I, again, this is a specialty that I don't know anything about, there are certainly applications for legal documents to do this kind of thing. Um, you might look at salesforce.com. These guys specialize in this kind of workflow. It's a workflow issue. That's right. That's right. It's uh, Salesforce. Salesforce.com is a very well-known customer relations management company or CRM company. Okay. They have a broad variety of applications. Um, somebody in our chat room, Cold Fusion in our chat room says uh, there are document management systems for this. There's one called Image Silo. Okay. So that would be another one uh, to look at. Is uh, that S-I-L-O? Yep. Or? Yep. Okay. Like Corn Silo. Okay. A silo for your images. Uh, PC Guy says there's an enterprise-grade uh, software to do this. This, this is, the problem I'm having is I just don't cover business uh, workflow okay. stuff. It's a it's a specialty. But uh, Open Text Corporation makes okay. something enterprise content management or ECM from Open Text. There's a lot of uh, solutions around this. I and uh, the, the problem is I don't know how well they work. Yeah. And uh, but you know. These are expensive solutions, so it's right. rarely a difficulty to get somebody from that company to come demo it for you, even to give you a trial. Because well, that's what I was hoping that you yeah, could, you know, that somebody could tell me about a company that would come out and, and show it, you know, demo it, and and actually look at our workflow and see if this would work. For that's us. what you need. That's yeah. what you need. And oftentimes these things are custom. Consultant. Yeah, but since you're doing legal pleadings, that's a very common thing. I'm sure there are solutions that are kind of out of the box that will uh, will do that. Okay, because, I mean, we look at a lot of tax ID records, we look at a lot of bank records, you know, payroll records, as well as leading, as well as legal pleadings and whatnot. So. Yeah. It's the, the, the overall phrase that covers it is workflow, document management. Workflow. HP and lots of companies will send a consultant over and uh, you could spend millions of dollars on this. I don't know enough to give you a, a good direction, though. I'm sorry to say. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Little law and order. <laughs> Wallace, Mexico, Missouri. Is that how they say it, Mexico? Hello. Hey, Wallace. Welcome. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, got a question. I've uh, got an old XP box that I put a RAID card in and two drives to make a home file server. But I'd like to have something set up where I could access the home file server from my Mac, from my Windows machine, and also over the Internet remotely. Yeah, XP is probably not the ideal operating system for this because it doesn't have built-in things like SSH and, you know, the, the kind of services you'd like so that you can access this <clears throat> across platform and so forth. That's why when people use, uh, buy network-attached storage devices, which essentially this is what this is, they're usually running Linux. Have you, okay. have you considered putting Linux on it? 
No, I haven't. I've never really messed with Linux too much, so I, I wasn't real familiar with doing that. Linux uh, is a, of course, free operating system based on Unix or built to duplicate in Unix. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, it is particularly well suited to this kind of uh, project. Um, there is a Linux distribution called FreeNAS, F-R-E-E-N-A-S. Okay. That is at FreeNAS.org. And it's specifically designed to do this. <clears throat> now, with my remote, the remote application, I'd like to do the problem. The other problem I run into is my ISP um, doesn't provide me with a static IP address. So, right. So you have to use in a case like that something called Dyn DNS. D Y N D N S. I don't know if FreeNAS supports it or not. By the way, I should correct myself. FreeNAS isn't based on Linux. It's based on BSD, which is a true Unix uh, operating system. But it, that won't make any difference from your point of view. It's based on free BSD. <clears throat> but it supports sharing across Windows, Apple. Uh, it includes uh, ZFS, which is an amazing file system. It has remote access. It has plugins uh, for uh, all the servers, you know, the... Windows Media Server, iTunes, all of that stuff. It should do everything you want. And if it doesn't, then there are other similar uh, things, you know, Unix or Linux or free software-based uh, things like this that'll that'll do all sorts Something of stuff. Something that would work with the um, DYS or the DYN. Dyn DNS, uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. You know, I, I'm sure that there's a Dyn DNS plugin for this. Um, okay. Dyn DNS okay. is, is exactly to solve this particular problem, which is that you don't have a static address, an, an unchanging right. address from your internet service provider. You have a dynamic address, and that makes it harder for somebody, <clears throat> if you're on the road, to log in because we don't know what address exactly. to log into. So what Dyn right. DNS does, it runs a little bit of software on the server that periodically telegraphs the Dyn DNS server saying, uh, my address now is this. My address now is this. And so instead of contacting your server directly, you contact it through Dyn DNS, which knows what the latest address is. I see. <clears throat> okay, well, I appreciate it. FreeNAS does support Dyn DNS, Gmiola in the uh, chat room tells me. So, you know, FreeNAS is a pretty heavy duty thing, but you want, you kind of want that. You want something that is security focused for one thing, right? Because you're going to put this out on the public internet, which means people will be banging on it. You don't want them to get into your network. So you, you absolutely want something that is kind of tried and true and tested uh, for this kind of thing. <clears throat> it's, it's a shame, you know, um, Microsoft made something called Windows Home Server that really was great. Uh, HP made some very nice Windows Home Server devices, and then everybody stopped making the hardware. <clears throat> and it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it was very easy to use. Work, did it did all the things you wanted to do? And since you're, you know, you already know Windows, it was a very easy thing for you to use. And you can still get it, but I just I'd be nervous about it because I it, I get the feeling it's kind of nobody, you know, without hardware support, I imagine Microsoft will stop making it. WHS Windows Home Server. You can take a look at that as well. That's not free, by the way. Free NAS is free. Kathy, Ventura, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Thanks. I'm a brass player. I'm a, a, a musician, a brass player, and I want to teach over Skype. Oh, how neat. What a good idea. Because I have students sometimes that are far away. Yeah. I talked uh, a few months ago to a guy who does uh, teaches how to use um, Apple's Logic software, it's music composition software, and does Skype classes more than one student at a time. Yep. Great well, idea. I want to teach my, my older brother to play the trumpet. <laughs> okay. What I'm trying to figure out is if there's a webcam, a good webcam that has pretty decent audio. Do you have any ideas? I generally recommend, and I, I do believe the audio is good, although brass is tough because it's, yeah, it is. it's loud. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do recommend, in general, the Logitech uh, cameras. They're very good. Um, however, you might want to mic it separately for brass. Hmm. So the C910 is good. Yep. You can, uh, and that's a, it's the best video. <clears throat> you don't have to use its audio, understand. You can hook up a microphone into your computer and tell Skype, get the video from the camera, the audio from this microphone. That's a good idea. Yeah, you're not, you're not tied to, any, to the camera's audio. 
Um, so, uh, you know, and there are lots of good solutions. I, you know, as a brass player, you probably know what the best microphones are for brass. Well, I've never used one before. That's sort of why I'm asking. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I would probably... Depends on your budget. Mm -hmm. um, sure just sent me, and I think this is a really good solution for computers. I'm looking in my closet here, see if I can find it. <clears throat> they make a microphone called the SM58. It's a dynamic microphone. Uh, who, who makes it? Sure, S H U R E. Okay. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a, it's, it probably be, you know, it's used in clubs. It's used by rock and roll bands. Um, it's a very high quality, and they sell it in a bundle with a device that hooks it up to the computer via USB. Yeah, there we <clears throat> And then, now you're going to get really good audio. Yeah. Um, another possibility is a company called Blue, bluemic.com. Yeah, I, I saw their webcam. Yeah, they make very good micro professional microphones, often used in recording studios. But they also make a, a range of consumer microphones that are used, uh, USB microphones that are often used by people who are doing this. <clears throat> and their Yeti, their Blue Yeti, Y-E-T-I, uh -huh. would probably be a very good choice for a trumpet. All right. And my French horn. And your French, yeah, French horn. Oh, that's a beautiful instrument. Tr French horn would be easier than a trumpet, I think. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, opposite usually. <laughs> I would take a look at the either the Yeti or the SM58 plus. The SM58 is a stu is a real microphone, not a, uh, a computer microphone, but the Shure does make a, a USB interface for it, and they bundle it together. It's about 200 bucks though. It's not cheap. All right, maybe we'll just go with a just a little webcam mic. <laughs> I would try that, unless brother is willing to spend some money. Say again. Yeah, until it, unless it gets too distorted, and then I'll think about it. Uh, yeah, the SM58, they make an SM58 with an X2U adapter that turns it into a USB mic. <clears throat> and it's a little bundle, and boy, you're going to get great sound. You're going to get you know great what? sound. I, what about, I, I have an old Walkman microphone that was a really good little microphone. It's the thing that we used to use when we were trying to make our own little cassette tapes. Do you think there's an adapter that would yeah. convert well, that? Yeah, I mean, uh, what is the, uh, if it's a, I don't know what the Walkman it's microphone. A sure, it was a sure microphone. And it, does it have a, a little mini phono jack coming out of it? What's coming out of it? A, a mini, yeah, a, a phono jack. <clears throat> okay. Then you probably don't even need an adapter. You just put it into the microphone uh, input on your computer. See how that works. Uh. Ah! Oh, light comes on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls and the Gizwiz right after this. Busy hatching if I only had a brain. I'd unravel every riddle. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And a song dedicated to my brain. I have externalized it and put it into our chat room. And frankly, there are very few uh, questions that cannot be answered with the help of my external brain, a.k.a. the chat room. Thank you, guys, for all your help. Uh, it is time now to speak to our... Um, what's the opposite of a brain? <laughs> our, our, our gadget... I don't know what it is, but it's on the other end of this line. <laughs> our gadget guru, Dick DiBartolo. The brainless. He is Mad Magazine's maddest writer, and he's a gadget hound. We call him the Gizwiz. Hey! Dickie D. Yeah, how how are you, you doing? I'm very well. So uh, I followed your uh, your story on Facebook and Twitter. You apparently lost. Your cable went out. You didn't have Turner Classic Movies. It, it's very funny. Yes, yeah, selected channels were out, and Turner Classic Movies was just black. And I live on that channel. I chat. know you do. You love the old yeah. movies. And yeah. so, you know, I, I phoned in, and it sounded dubious to me, but the guy said, oh... Uh, take the cable box out and give me the serial number because I have three cable boxes. And he said, uh, yeah, that we can fix from here. I, I said, are you sure about this? And he said, oh, yeah, 24 to 48 hours. And I said, and you'll call me? And he goes, no, you just keep watching that channel. <laughs> It'll just get better it all by itself. <laughs> and, and when it gets, when it shows up, then it's, it's working. <laughs> and if not, he said, oh, well, then just call back and start over again. Oh, some people don't understand uh, old movie withdrawal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I called back, and it was going to be another. The earliest they could do is another week. And I was moaning, and Doctor Mom said, "Here, 
contact this person and then someone else said J just tell them who you are and so i this did had, this all things. happened on social in social networks you happened on in facebook social, and, and, and did you tweet it all about this i tweeted it yeah. at like 6 p.m friday i got a call from time warner some honcho he said i'm sorry it's nine o'clock at night but i'm just getting your email <sighs> And uh, this poor guy. Can we, be, can, we be there, can we be there Sunday at 8 a.m.? Wow. <laughs> said, wow, is it possible to just make it 10 a.m.? And they said, all right, 10 a.m. So anyway, yes, it's going to be So we'll find out tomorrow. That is, that is the power of social media, I got to tell exactly. you. Yeah. Yeah. And I must say, I have been, I joined the cable system when Teleprompter owned it. Now, you will know the name teleprompter they owned the new york the man you're, you're in manhattan and they own the cable system in manhattan they owned the cable system <laughs> at when it first started then i believe westinghouse bought it wow and, and then time warner so i mean you know and i'm uh, sure when that i had when i had cable they would just call in the morning and say what do you want to watch because <laughs> just, well, that's what i'm saying just, the infrastructure in manhattan probably isn't state of the art no, no, and no, not at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. the wires, are, you know, I said to the guy, I can tell you now that it's only one cable box you have to worry about because the wires are draped down the front of the building <laughs> and the back of the building. <laughs> because when they hooked it up, the guy said, well, the cable box in the back, it's easy to drape the wire down the back of the building. And, yeah, so. Holy moly. It's kind of amazing <laughs> it works at all. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Because well, I, I hope you get your Turner Classic movies back. Meanwhile... Yes. Uh, and by the way, Dr. Mom is in our chat room, and I mentioned that they're my brain. Well, she apparently Dr. Mom is also your consultant. The chat room is, is both brain and consultant. Yeah, and amazing and humorous. They're very funny. They too. are very, very funny. So uh, you come every week to bring us a bearing gift, bearing a gadget. What do you got for us today? Uh, this gadget is very clever. It's called the Ampli 600 a -M -P Amplified. A-M-P-L-I. Yeah, uh, LI 600, Amplified Emergency Contact uh, uh, Connect Phone. So this is if you want to keep in touch with somebody, perhaps an older person, but you don't want to pay a monthly fee, you can do it with this, but you have to explain to everybody whose phone number you program how it works. So basically, it's a phone. You program in a message. You program in six phone numbers. The person in whose house it is on the phone is a big red emergency button. It comes with a wristwatch type emergency button. It comes with a lanyard that you can wear. So this so is this is the uh, this is the non-subscription version of I've fallen and I can't get up. That is correct. That assuming that the, that the six one of those six people are going to be home. But Leo, what's great is. If one of those six people is home, when they hear the recorded message, they push any button on their keypad and it turns on the speakerphone at the residence of the person oh, who that's interesting. sent. So, so, so if that you have you an can, elderly parent, you give them this phone. It's about, what, about 150 bucks? Uh, yes. You uh, give uh, them the pendant. This is 200, but uh, on Amazon I saw it for like 105. Okay. Oh, it's even less. Yeah. And yeah. and if, if somebody falls down or they, you know, they're not feeling well or whatever, and they can't get to the phone, they press the button. It will ring all these people. These people will then press a button on their phone saying, "Mom, are you okay? What's going on?" And they can hear you talk to them. Exactly. What exactly. a good idea. And it's funny that you said mom because I did get an email from your mom when I talked about this earlier on uh, the Weekly Daily Gizmos. And she said, don't let Leo get me this for Christmas. I'll never see him again. <laughs> <laughs> she also asked if she could use you as her emergency number because she knew I wouldn't answer. So I thought that was a little <laughs> odd. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it's That's good. Cool. It's the, also Am the Ampli 600 from G-Mark, G-E-E-M-A-R-C. Exactly. Exactly. And you can boost the volume in case you're hard of hearing. A strobe goes off when the phone rings. Oh, so it's, it's a lot of phone for a little more than 100 bucks. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that tip. You can find Dick's uh, gadgets, including this one, on his website, gizwiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. And, you know, for fun, when you're there, don't forget to take the What the Heck Is It game. Uh, you can win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. And, you know, we you give can. that to you as a plug, but you don't make any money on this. It's just something you do for fun. No. 
I don't make any money. Cost you money. I I do sell occasionally mad crap on my website, but certainly I don't make any money on uh, the game. It's just, it's fun. You know what? A lot of people just, uh, just say, Dick, if you have a mad, I'll take it. If you don't have a mad, I love playing the game. It's just fun. So it's really great fun. It's just fun. Dick, are you going to do World News Now soon? Do uh, some holiday gadgets? Uh, yes, uh, I'm doing gadgets under $25. I recorded it uh, a couple days ago, and it should air next week. Look for it on ABC, uh, middle of the night. Middle of the night. World when News you now. can't sleep and you Prime turn time. on your TV, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Appreciate it. Hang around. We're going to do the uh, weekly Daily Gizwiz, our weekly podcast, in uh, just a moment with Dick D. Bartolo. I'm also going to take another call in just a moment before we wrap up the show. Before I do... Uh, let's see, Dusty in Seymour, Texas. You might be the last call of the day. Hi, Dusty. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Hey, uh, I want to know about the HTC uh, View, kind of like the flyer. I just want to know what your input is on that. It's I'm a... looking at buying a 7-inch tablet, and I've used HTC phones for quite some time. And I've kind of gotten partial to that brand. I'm a big fan of HTC. I do not have not tried a View, but the View is their 7-inch a uh, tablet on uh, Sprint, um, and I have to say I, I've not been a huge Android tablet fan, um, but I do think they're getting better and better. This one is still Honeycomb, not Gingerbread. It, actually, it's not even Honeycomb, is it? It's Android 2.3, so it's uh, it's Gingerbread. Um, but I like a seven-inch tablet. I I would look at this. I would also, uh, you know, is 3G important to you or 4G? Well, I drive a truck for a living. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm then you want it. Houston, you... I get 4G fine. But yeah, that's... you definitely want the 4G if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're out and about. Yeah, no, I think this is a good tablet. I would recommend it, Dusty. 